Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Jim Harkowitz once again from the Canyon Community Church in Lakehead, California. It's June the 26th, 2022. This morning, we'll be continuing our series on 1 Corinthians, correcting spiritual immaturity in the local church. We'll be looking at chapter 4. As always, let's have a worship song to prepare our hearts for God's Word, and then we'll join our message in progress.
This morning we'll be picking up our series in 1 Corinthians. And the theme of this great book of the Bible, the New Testament, is correcting spiritual immaturity in the local church. This letter is an amazing letter. It's written to an amazing situation. This letter is corrective. It's practical in its nature as the Apostle Paul is addressing a number of issues occurring in the local church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth is unique but not unique. The church at Corinth is just a community church like any other community church in any other town, including us. And we begin the series looking at a, the background of Corinth. And it was a morally pit of a town. It was so bad that it was this rampant people living for themselves and idolatry and sexual misconduct that the rest of the Roman Empire had their own term for the Corinthians. If you were engaged in rampant sexual, casual sexual encounters and just a drunkard, then you were a Corinthian. They had his own term. And so they were so bad, yet out of that moral pit of despair and of scat, the Apostle Paul came and shared a simple truth of the gospel message and people believed. And their lives were turned around. They were born again. And they were beginning to grow, but yet even there were some growing pains that was taking place at the church of Corinth. As Paul's going to be addressing some questions and some issues that was taking place, that's why the purpose of this letter is. He's, he's helping this church, to, trying to get them back on the right track, because they were getting off track. And we saw in chapters 1 to 4 of 1 of, uh, Corinthians that Paul's addressing the issue of divisions occurring within that church of Corinth. And kind of reviewing uh, chapter 1, verse 10, 11, he said, 10 to 12, he said, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, that be no divisions or schisms among you, that you be made complete of the same mind of the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, of Chloe's by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. And I mean by this, I mean that some of you is saying, I'm, I, I'm a Paul, or I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, and I follow uh, Cephas or Simon Peter, and I, I follow Christ. See, the church had divided up under various human leaders, and with competing rivalries and unloving attitudes toward each other, much like team sports in our country today. Uh, you talk about uh, in college football, Alabama versus Auburn. If you're ever familiar with it, it is a tough a rivalry. Or like Oregon State and Oregon University. There's some serious rivalry goes on in those college town, college football towns. Or like the LA Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants. We have people who even have fight each other and, and people being killed over it. It's crazy. It's just a sport. But people divide up among that, and that was, that was the attitude what was going on in the town of Corinth. And to help us understand the culture of Corinth, the Corinthian believers were bringing into the church worldly thinking. The local Greek culture, which, with its love of philosophy and of its rival philosophic systems of human thought and reasoning, and they argued, the, the town was arguing among some towns, who was better, Socrates or uh, Plato? And they were divided up under each other. And this was coming into the church and dividing up under human, different human leaders. And they were pitting one group against another. And Paul discussed the folly in the emptiness of human wisdom and contrasted to God's wisdom. And the inability of the natural man or the non-believer to comprehend God's truth, no matter how wise they are, or how educated they may have been, or how even how religious they may have been. They could not understand the things, the mysteries of God. We saw in chapter 3 that Paul then revealed the root cause of these divisions. Carnal Christians, in other words, spiritually immature believers, they were infants in Christ. They were Christians, they were born again, they received Christ as their Savior, but they had failed to grow. They were stunted in their spiritual growth. And Paul says, you still need milk. You, you cannot handle some of the deeper truths. You are still acting like babies, like, like children in a church nursery. Yet they were adults with this type of attitudes and going on. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 4 says, And I, brethren, could not speak to his spiritual men, but to men of the flesh, to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you're not uh, yet able, able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able to, for you're still fleshly. 
For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men or the unsaved? For one says, I'm a Paul, and one of the others, are you not mere men? At the end of chapter 3, Paul reminds the believers not to boast in their own wisdom, but to be humble. And that was part of the problem, this humanistic attitude they had, that they were living like they were before they were Christians, this mindset of pride and arrogance. 1 Corinthians 3, 18-21, he said, Let no one deceive himself. If any among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, so that they are useless. So, that, so then, let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. Which brings us up to chapter 4. Paul's going to wrap up this section on divisions within the church, which covers chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. Bottom line, if you walk away from nothing from this message, is divisions and rival factions have no place in Christ's church. I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. We'll read the whole chapter, but we'll cover it this morning. 1 Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 1. And God's word says, Let a man regard us in this manner, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it's required for stewards that one be found trustworthy. But for me, it is a very small thing that I would be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. For the one who examines me is the Lord. Verse 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment for the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring to light all the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now these things, brethren, I have frequently applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that none of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? And if you, didn't, if you did receive it, then why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already filled. You've already become rich. You've already become kings without us. And indeed, I wish you were become kings that we might also reign with you. For I think God has exhibited his apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent or wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. Till this present hour we are both hungry and thirsty, both poorly clothed and roughly treated, and are homeless. And we toil working with our own hands, even when we are reviled we bless, and we are persecuted we endure. When we are slandered we try to, to conciliate. We, we try to become the scums of the earth, the dregs of all things, even till now. I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you to be imitators of me. For this reason, I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some have become arrogant, as though if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. I will find out, not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist of words, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love, and a spirit of gentleness? May God bless his word this morning. All I can say is, wow. He is ramping things up. We're going back to chapter 4. He said, let us regard us in this manner as servants of Christ. And Paul uses an interesting word. That normally we see the word servant. We think of the word doulos. But here's a different word picture he uses. And the word is that of a huperatas, derivative of two words, means to be an under oarsman, that of an, a, a subordinate of a minister or officer or servant. And it's about an under rower creates the picture of a, of a galley ship. Now, there are different types of sailing ships in that. They had ships with sails, but a galley ship was one that was powered by oarsmen. And what they were doing, they were, they were rowed by slaves who were chained to the benches and rowing, pulling oars in synchronization to a drumbeat of a supervisor. Paul saying that he's a he, nor Paul, or Cephas, or not church bosses or church rulers, but they're galley slaves. They're servants of God working together in sync, we're common cause under one leader, who is Jesus Christ. 
That's an amazing thing to see. Now, and to the Corinthians, that was a very common word picture because it was, remember, it's, Corinth was a seaport city, and there was a lot of galley ships coming and going. We fully understand what he was saying. But if you remember the, the movie Ben Hur, remember that old movie? They had the galley slaves and the rowers, the same concept. Folks, there's no church bosses today, despite what some of them like to think. There's only one leader, and that is Jesus Christ. In fact, we don't, we've looked at what we saw in our study in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1 and 3. It is He risen and glorified, who walks among the seven golden lampstands which represent his church. There's only one boss, and that's Jesus. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's not anyone's church, but his. And the problem is we think, well, this, you know, we think we're a church boss, and we're not. We're all just servants. Well, all of us are each galley slaves. We're co-laborers co with the, the duties that God has assigned us, serving him. And sometimes people compare ministries to each other. Church ministries are not, they should not be in competition with each other. We're each co-laboring for Christ in whatever location God has placed us. And sometimes people like to compare churches, and they'll compare churches, and they measure ministry success. How successful is that? It's an invisible tape measure. <laughs> By, in worldly terms of, how big is a church? Or how many campuses does it have? What is seating capacity? How many programs do they have? What's its size? What's its church budget? In the 10,000s or in the millions? And all that view is carnal. It's worldly. Let me repeat. If we view ministry success by how big a church is, or how many programs it has, or how big its budget is, and its numbers, its nickels, its numbers, its noise, and its carnal, worldly thinking. There is only one true measure of, of ministry success. That is faithfulness to Jesus and his word. And every, someday every individual and every ministry, including this, will be evaluated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Were we faithful to his word? Were we faithful in obedience to him? That's the important thing. And that is true success of any ministry did you know, just a little tidbit, I did a little Google search this morning, the average size of churches today, the median average size of the church is 75. We like to think of accessible ministry as big in the thousands and multi-campuses. The vast majority of churches in the United States is under 75 people. And we don't think about that. We think it's all big and successful. The biggest challenge of a larger church is how do you get people in a smaller group so they can associate in fellowship? That's the biggest challenge of a larger ministry. Praise the Lord for them. Pray for them. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the staff. Pray for that ministry to be effective and as they you know, bring growth as they're faithful to God's word as it goes forth. We're all co-laboring with a large church or small church. It's all for the same cause. We have one boss, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 1, And when stewards of the mysteries of God... And then moreover, in this case, verse 2, it's required of a steward to be found trustworthy. A steward is a, a house manager, someone who cares for something belonging to another. Again, a, a, you go on vacation, you ask your neighbor, or you ask a family member, or you hire a person to take care of your plants or your pets and stuff like that, or to watch your dog. They're, you didn't give them the house, you didn't give them the pet. They're caretakers. They are a steward. And trusting, caring for something that doesn't belong to them, it belongs to someone else. And each of us are stewards of what God has blessed us with. The stewards of time, he's given us another day. The stewards of our abilities and, and, and spiritual gifts and other skills that God has given us. Are we using them for the Lord Jesus Christ? But well, somebody have to give an account to him for that. But stewards of the mysteries of God. We discussed the mysteries of God earlier. In the mystery parables of the kingdom, Brother Jeff did a great job, did he not, last week? The parable of the sower. God's word's going forth to how people receive it reveals their heart, and that's what's going on. And loves the other mystery parables of the kingdom and found in Matthew chapter 13. The point is, where Paul planted or Paulus watered, both are co-workers, they're faithful stewards of God, one church leader, and that is Jesus Christ, not, not human leaders. Verse 3, verse 4. But as for me, it's a very small thing if I be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself, Paul writes. So if I'm conscious of nothing against myself, yet I'm not by this acquitted, the one who examines me is the Lord. Paul reveals here that 
not only was there a divisive competitive spirit amongst the different factions within the church, but a harsh critical attitude putting down the other groups that was taking place at the, at the same time. He said in verse 18 of uh, 1 Corinthians 3 says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone thinks you're as wise in this age, you must become foolish, that he might become wise. You know, it's so easy to be a critic. It takes no, no thinking at all, just snobbish pride. Thinking one's superior, more knowledgeable than the other person. And being critical is easy to do. It's really hard to restrain once you start down the road of being critical. And by the way, as it, being a critical spirit, it sums up the, most of social media today, does it not? People harp and complain and they come off like they're experts and they really don't know. People say the most outrageous things. I'm not a big fan of social media. It's a useful tool, but I'm not a fan of it. That's why you don't see me posting very much. Because as if they're the final judge or answer on any given topic. You name a topic, oh, they know everything. And it involves no work, no thinking at all to be critical. But Proverbs 17.28 says this in New Living Translation, Even fools are thou wise when they keep silent. When their mouth is shut, they, they seem intelligent. I'll say no more on that. Paul did not care that some of the Corinthians thought he was a loser, that his ministry was a flop. Their evaluation of his ministry didn't count. didn't matter. He was only focused on pleasing the Lord who will judge him in that coming day. And Paul did not trust his own evaluation of his ministry. He says, I think I'm doing okay. I think my conscience is clear, but me, my evaluation doesn't count. It's his evaluation. Am I, doing, am I faithful in being a good servant of the Lord? Verse 5. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait for the Lord who will come, who will bring to light both the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motive of men's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. It's important that we focus on our own ministry rather than the ministry of others. It's easy to do. It's easy to be critical. Oh, they're not doing this. They should be doing that. But what are we doing for the Lord Jesus? And not to prejudge or evaluate people. The thing is, we don't know what people do. We don't know the unknown acts of ministry that takes place that God's people quietly do as they serve the Lord. Those acts of kindness and mercy are done in private, not in not a public eye to see whether they're taking a pie to someone or helping someone. We don't see it. And sometimes sees, well, they're not doing anything for the Lord. You don't know, and neither do I. I don't know what you're doing. Just leave it to God and just focus on what we need to be doing for Him. And God will set it right. Verse 5. The each man's praise will come to him from God. And the good news, well, God will find something good to praise us for as we seek to serve Him. If we seek to serve Him, we'll find praise for Him. And all those things God knows, even the things done in darkness that no one else knows, God knows our hearts and He knows what we're doing. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have frequently applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you, them, you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant on behalf of one against the other. Again, that attitude of arrogance to that. That we learn not to exceed what is written. And it's interesting that you, th what, what, what's he talking about? This, what's written? He's talking about the graphe, the word graphe there, the written. He's talking about the written scripture, this book. Folks, we need to understand that we don't go beyond what this book says. And everything we think, everything we say, everything we do, even our experiences must be subordinate to the authority of God's written word. If we're doing something that the scripture doesn't condone, it doesn't say, then we need to be back and evaluate it. What are we doing? And what motivation are we doing it? And we're going to find that the Corinthian church was really messing up in a number of things. They were ignoring the written graphia scripture and going off and down, down rabbit trails of all sorts. It's going to be, you see later on, we're talking about the abuse of the spiritual gifts. We're talking about sexual immorality in the church and a host of other things, divorce, remarriage, all this stuff. They have forgotten the scriptures as a result. That's why Paul is how to write this corrective letter. James chapter 3, verse 13, 18 says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have jitter, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not from that which comes down from above, but it's earthly, natural, demonic. 
And where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder in every evil thing. And folks, pause right there. You look at this, the Corinthian believers, some of them were operating in the flesh with worldly wisdom. And you catch that. Jealousy, selfish ambition, disorder, strife, divisions, and evil things. Verse 17, James 3, 17. But the wisdom of God above, from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We also saw a very similar passage in Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at Philippians 2 for a moment. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8, Paul's writing. He says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard each other as more important than yourselves. Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, did not re regard equality of God the thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. And finally, Mark chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus said, He called the disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to be first or great, he must be the last and servant of all. We're to have a servant's heart. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 8 to 13. We'll continue in 1 Corinthians 4. He said, you're already filled. You've already become rich. You've become kings without us. And indeed, I wish you had become kings that we might also reign with you. For I think God exhibited us as apostles as last of all, as men condemned to death. We become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We, you are strong, we are distinguished, but we are without honor. And to this present hour, both hungry and thirsty, both poorly clothed and roughly treated and homeless, and we toil, working with our own hands, when we reviled, we bless, when we persecuted, we endure, when we are slandered, we try to, reconcil to, recon to conciliate, we become as the scum of the earth, the dregs of all things, even until now. Paul is engaging in what we could call holy sarcasm. And I don't understand what the definition of sarcasm is, the use of irony to mock or convey contempt. And irony, to give a definition of irony, is the expression of one's meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite, typically for humorous or emphatic effect. And Paul uses holy sarcasm here, and it's obvious because he's already said they're carnal. He already said, they're, look, you're infants in Christ, but you're acting like you're kings. You're acting like you're so wise. He's using sarcasm with this. He said, you're already full, you're already rich, you're already like kings, but we're weak, hungry, and poorly dressed. You're a wise, prudent, discerning all wisdom, but we are fools for Christ. You're strong and socially important, and we are the scum of the earth, the lowlifes, the rubes of the world, the dregs of all things. And you guys are acting like you ought to be, be rewarded and, and have jurisdiction and reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom. <laughs> Yet we, the rest of us, are still suffering for the hardship for the gospel. I don't know about you, but I would say, oh my goodness, ouch, that hurts. I would be hanging my head in shame if I were them. And some were in Corinth. They realized, well, I've been off on the wrong track and I got puffed up myself. But then there's some who would not respond. They would not take this very well. And because they're operating in the flesh, they're operating in worldly wisdom, and it was affected their thoughts. And that's why the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. It's easy, it's natural to let the world's philosophy, the world's viewpoint of things impact us and affect us. We start thinking of things in worldly, worldly terms, by worldly measurements, and not being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And as Christians, we're called to have a, think, a different thinking process. We're called to have the wisdom of God and think like God thinks, not as human men and the unsaved think. Paul continues, verse 14 through 17. So that I don't write to things to shame you, but admonish you as my beloved children. For you have countless tutors in Christ, that you would not have many fathers. And in Christ Jesus, I have became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you to be imitators of me. 
For this reason I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul's correcting these, these carnal, immature believers like a father would his children. You know, uh, Father's Day was just celebrated. Being a father is not an easy task, especially in the 21st century. Fathers are beat up or abused, and, and most men have forgotten what it's like to be a father. And sadly, many men have never had a father figure, so they don't know what it likes to be a man. That's the, so important to every young man needs a father figure to mentor him, to learn what it's like to be a real man. And every young lady needs to have a father figure to learn what it's like, what a real man is really like. Because there's a lot of heartache becomes because we don't understand what a father is. A father is engaged. A father is not dis disengaged, you deal with it. A father is engaged in their children's lives day in, day out, teaching them what is right, what God's like, what a real man is like, a man of ethics, a man of conviction, and to be strong. And, and because it's not there, many men just are, oh, oh, oh I don't, I'm afraid. That's not a man. A man is courageous. And you think of the different men of the Bible, of Joshua. God says, be strong, be courageous, and I will give you the victory. Or of Gideon, who was hiding in, in the wine press, and said, greetings, you valorous man. Who, me? I'm hiding. And God's going to use Gideon, and God can use men. He wants to use men, and men, he wants to use you to change the course of our country. But it begins with changing the course in your home and in your family. Paul is dealing like a father. His children were, his toddlers were not doing good. And he does, he's going to respond not out of authority, because he has a sense of responsibility. He says, I'm your spiritual father. I, I, have some, I feel like I'm responsible. I don't want to bring you the gospel. And you, you, you start on the right path, but you've got off track. And a father comes along and is going to apply the rod of instruction or the board of education to the seat of instruction. And we live in a day where, well, oh, discipline? Oh, no. We can't do that. Oh, yeah. The Bible says a lot about that, in fact. Let's look to Hebrews chapter 12 for a moment. Because we get into chapter 5, and Paul begins to ramp up. He's going to do some, some parental discipline, correction discipline coming up real short. We get into the chapter 5 and then the chapter 6. But in Hebrews chapter 12, we need to understand something. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 to 11, the Bible talks of the fact that our Heavenly Father, as our Father, if He's your Father, at will, will, correct and train you. Hebrews 12, verses 3 to 11. It says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, that you will not grow weary and lose heart. For you have not let, resisted to the point of shedding blood for your striving against sin. And you've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. I said, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom he loves, he disciplines. And he scourges or he spanks Every son whom he receives. And it's for discipline that you endure. For God deals with you with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if we without discipline, we all become partakers in your illegitimate son, children, not sons. Moreover, we had earthly fathers who did discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not much more be subject to the father and spirits and live? For they discipline for a short time seems best for them, and he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet that those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. As parents, we all remember the day when we had kids and a little toddler trying to find an outlet. They're going to go stick something in the outlet. And what did you do? Oh, son, have a nice day. He said, don't do that. And of course, being a willful little child like Jimmy Harkabus was, and not you guys, you are just perfect children, right? Boys and girls. I'm going to do it anyhow. I'm going to see if it's going to work. And whoop! Why did, why did my dad spank me? He should have spanked me more, but that's another story. Another time. 
He loved me. He didn't want me to get hurt. And the reality is, we have a Heavenly Father who will at times lovingly discipline us. Now, we talk about discipline, you always think in negative terms, but discipline is always training. The Bible says this in Proverbs 22, 6, says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, there's no guarantee. Sometimes children still depart. Didn't Adam need depart? God, best parent ever. But still, there's training. And part of a mother and a father's job, especially the father, is those kids get beyond the toddlers and the 8 and 9 and 10, 11, 12 and all up. That's where the father figure comes so important to have a dad who says, you're not going to do that. Here's why you're not going to do that. Here's why we don't do that. And don't you do it or else. And then you got to be able to follow through on the or else. I'll never forget, I watched a YouTube, great video. This kid was not doing his chores. He played his Xbox. <laughs> And the dad took the Xbox, took it outside, and slammed it on her on pieces of were, And they go, ah! was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. He thought, the kid thought it was the end of the world. Probably the best thing ever happened to him. And he learned there's such a thing as consequences in life. And many young men and many young women think we can go through life and not do anything. You can do whatever we want, and there's never a consequence. And sadly, our society is condoning that with no bail. You break a law, you can just take whatever you want, and there's no consequences. But eventually, the consequences will catch up, and usually they're catastrophic. I was reading an article where two people uh, wanted to break into a house the other day, and they were shot dead. They never expected that. Home invasion, not a good thing to do. Just saying. Verse 14, understand that God is our Father's work in our lives. Both positive training, sometimes corrective as needed. He, he's not going to let you get away with it if you're his child. If you're not his child, then you belong to someone else and you don't belong to God. But if you belong to God, knowing Jesus is your Savior, trust me, God will get your attention one way or another. He'll get, get my attention too if I'm, if I'm messing up. 1 Corinthians 4.18 Now some have become arrogant as though I'm not coming to you. But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist of words, but in power. And to the smarty pants, there are always some, those in the church who think they're too big, they're too good, they're too good for their own britches, they're too smart, they're so wise, they're so business-oriented. Paul's planning to come and, and deal with these characters. And he will, if necessary, get in their grill, get in their face to, to confront them directly for their carnality and their worldly attitudes. It says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. See, there are spiritual dynamics in play in life, and yes, in the church and beyond. And we're going to see, beginning in chapter 5, we'll be talking some examples of how, of the power of God, even spanking some of his children. I'll give you a quick example, just tidbit, Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. Two people who lied, and it didn't turn out well for them. You can read it on your own. We'll cover it next time we're in 1 Corinthians. Verse 21. What do you desire? Come with a rod or with love and a spirit of Jonas? Paul says, I'm coming as the Lord permits. He was currently at Ephesus. If I come, shall I come with a rod with firm corrective discipline or with a spirit of love and gentleness? It's up to them how they're going to apply. He's giving them a heads up. He's coming as the Lord wills. And what are they, what's their response going to be to this? Uh, they just think that Paul is just full of hot air uttering empty threats. Paul's ran up his tone. He's going to pull out the apostle and the, heavenly, and the spiritual father card because he's going to come to chapter 5 and deal with some, something that they were allowing to go on in their midst and not dealing with it, that of sexual immorality, of a kind that even the, 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 the unbelievers weren't doing. And he's going to call them on it. And he's going to, he's going to act. We need to understand something. God will deal with sin. In summary, in this section, we've learned four things. One, factions and divisions have no place in the local church. Two, those who engage in promoting factions are carnal, revealing themselves as carnal, immature believers that best, no matter how much they have a PhD in theology, whatever their issues are, be, they're still thinking, they're walking, they're acting according to their life before Christ. 
Thirdly, those who create divisions are at great risk of church discipline being ostracized, or even worse, direct divine chastisement. We'll see this we get it later on into this book. Paul's going to tell us in 1 Corinthians 11 that some of you, some of you have abused the Lord's Supper, and some of you are, some of you are sleeping. You're not, not talking about taking a nap during services. Some of them were died. They've been judged. Finally, we are called to live in harmony with each other, to be of one mind, united in thought and with purpose. Every believer, every leader, every ministry is the hooperates where each of us are each galley slaves rowing together in sync, listening to one person, our supervisor, the Lord Jesus Christ, who walks among his seven golden lampstands which represent his church. How are we this morning? Are we listening to him? Or are we focused on ourselves? Let us pray. Father, thank you for this great book of the Bible, hard-hitting, yet so practical and so needed in the days in which we live. Lord, you call for us not to be think more highly of ourselves, but rather to recognize who or what we have. Anything we have is from you. Even the ability to think, to be able to, to, to count, is all a gift from you. So there's no place for boasting. No reason to boast other than in boasting in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing on our time. May your Holy Spirit bring continue, continued application as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand. We'll have a song, and then we'll have lunch. Yeah.
blind as one.